Well, good morning, Life Church. It's a, a real pleasure to be speaking to you this morning in the next in your series, Songs of Faith, based on the Psalms. And uh, it's a particular pleasure to be speaking on Psalm 22, the Song of the Cross. The Bible is a remarkable book, and Psalm 22 is a remarkable section of the Bible. In many ways, Psalm 22 carries some exciting insights into the supernatural nature of our Bible, how the Holy Spirit inspired it from beginning to end. And it gives us some understanding of how this is not only true, but can be proven, if you like, as evidence of it. And I hope you'll see that a bit as we go through this morning. So although we'll be learning a lot about Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, we'll also be learning something about the Bible itself. I mean, when it was written, Psalm 22 was written by King David and he was writing a psalm of lament. He was writing a psalm that expressed his own agony and concern and sorrow and fear and disappointment. We're not quite sure what was going on, but it could well have been a setting where he was being chased down by King Saul. But in it, he clearly feels thoroughly attacked by everything. He's attacked by enemies. He's attacked by fears and doubts. His friends have deserted him. And worst of all, he feels that God has deserted him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is feeling at his wit's end. He's devastated by what's happened to him. And he, he writes this poem, this lament, to express his agony and his concern and his fear. But halfway through the psalm, he changes gear as he draws on his faith in God because he doesn't lose his faith. He just feels, where is God? God's not with me, not helping me. But halfway through the psalm, he begins to dig into his faith in God and his prayer becomes more positive and more triumphant. He believes God will meet with him. He believes that he will one day be vindicated and all the unfair things that have been said about him, all the unjust uh, cruelties that he's suffered will be shown to be unjust. He will be vindicated and he will again be able to go and worship God with his friends, with those he loves. He will again be in a place of security, in a place of joy and contentment. He will be victorious over these circumstances through God's help. Now that is a great psalm and a great uh, poem to read and it speaks into our lives. However, right from the earliest days of the church, this psalm was seen as having prophetic insights into the suffering and experience of Jesus Christ on the cross and then into the victory and the vindication of Jesus' resurrection. And in fact, this psalm is full of amazing prophetic verses, amazing statements that, that you, you, when you've got the New Testament, when you're reading from the Gospels, you realise these, these carry echoes, very profound echoes of what Jesus went through when he was crucified and actually what, what happened when he rose from the dead. Now, it's part of the mystery of how the Bible works that we're not saying David understood that the words he was writing would apply to a man, a, a long, long ahead descendant of his, a man who would come out from his line a thousand years later, Jesus of Nazareth, who would be crucified by a Roman uh, court, uh, Roman soldiers, Romans who weren't a power at all when David was writing, weren't even in anybody's mind. And Jesus wasn't in his mind. We're not saying that David understood that, but the Holy Spirit who inspired David's writing did know all about that. And so God led David to give insights into great David's greater son, Jesus, 
and his sufferings on the cross. As I said, right from the beginning of church history, Christians have found this to be true. In actual fact, their source is probably Jesus himself. Because when you read in the when you read the Gospels, you find that Jesus refers to Old Testament references to himself, and he makes passing reference to the Psalms. And there are, there were clearly opportunities when he explained how who he was and what he'd come to do fitted the Old Testament uh, narrative, and particularly the prophetic elements pointing forward to a Messiah and a Savior and a Redeemer. Probably one of the most outstanding. Uh, talks that Jesus gave, we know little about, but it was to the two on the road to Emmaus after he was risen from the dead. And Jesus spent hours, it would seem, telling them how what had happened to him was a fulfillment of what had been written in the prophets and the law and in the Psalms. In Luke 24, 44, he refers to the Psalms. And undoubtedly, Psalm 22 would have featured quite uh, largely in that, quite a big feature of that, that talk, I'm sure, especially when you got to the bit on the Psalms. Now, we also know that in the 40 days when Jesus was around with the disciples before the ascension, he spent a lot of time teaching them how what he'd done and who he was was God's supreme answer to man's need, the answer to the sins of the world. But it wasn't a surprise. It had been looked to and pointed to right throughout the Old Testament. And I'm sure Jesus gave them terrific insights into how he was a fulfiller, fulfillment of so much in the Old Testament. You know, the Passover lamb, for example, a prophetic type of Jesus. But he would have also explained how David, when writing, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was also giving insights into him, King David's greatest son, the Messiah, the Saviour King. And as I say, Psalm 22 is full of these insights. Spurgeon, the great Victorian preacher, said this, the whole psalm, it's referring to Psalm 22, the whole psalm refers to Christ containing much that cannot be applied to another. There is None like it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. 
You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. This psalm splits basically into two parts, quite evenly in a way. The first 21 verses give us an insight into Jesus' death on the cross and the agonies he went through for us. The second half, psalm, uh, verse 22 to 31, give an insight into the resurrection and the victory and the vindication that came through that resurrection. And who Jesus, what who Jesus has become, if you like, the Savior, the Redeemer, the King, and what that means for us and for the world today. So actually, as we get to the second part, which we'll do, we are looking at something relevant to us. Up to then, we'll be looking backwards, really, at the cross and the, the insights and prophetic insights into the cross and all that sort of thing. And then we'll see that there is something in this psalm about the world we live in and the times we're in. Let's start with the first half, the cross. And in this, we're looking at verses 1 to 21, which you've heard read to you already. One commentator I read, a man called Donald Williams, said this, these verses are the doorway into the mystery of Jesus' dying horrors. We must take off our intellectual shoes. We are standing on holy ground. He's right. These verses, verses 1 to 21, are extraordinary. They give us an extraordinary insight into what Jesus went through when he died on the cross. And they're actually incredibly accurate. And, and I need to keep reminding you, these verses were genuinely written 1,000 years before Jesus died on the cross. In fact, crucifixion as a means of executing people was probably unknown to David and any around him. I don't know if anybody knew about it. I think the Romans were the ones that really developed it. I think mean, they got the idea from someone else, but they were the ones that really developed it as a cruel and horrible way of executing criminals and people they despise. So there is some remarkable detail in this psalm, and we'll see that in a moment. But before we do, let me give you a thought which hit me quite strongly when I was preparing this this last few weeks. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He's part of the Trinity. He's one of the persons, the three persons of God. So he is God. And he would have known what David wrote a thousand years before he came as a man incarnate, born as that baby in Bethlehem, grew up as Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter, and ultimately was, done, was crucified. He would have known what David wrote, and he knew why he wrote it, why David wrote it. In other words, here's the startling and sobering and amazing truth. Jesus knew full well 
what was coming to him when he came to earth. He knew the agonies. He knew even some of the details before he ever came. And he still came because he loved you and he loved me. And he lived his life freely, blessing people, going around doing good, healing the sick, setting the, 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 the demon eyes free, but all the time knowing what was coming to him in a few years' time. And as we get nearer to the crucifixion, we find him telling his disciples, you know, I, I, I will die. And they don't believe him and they, they brush it aside. But as he is getting near to going to Jerusalem at the end, before the Last Supper and the crucifixion, it says he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was resolved, I'm going through with this. I've got to go for this. This is why I came. I came to die, to die for men and women, for their sin, to take their judgment on, my, to take their judgment on myself. But he knew what that would mean. Psalm 22 clearly tells us that the agonies, physical, psychological, spiritual, that Jesus was going to go through were well known to him long before he came. I think that tells us something about his love and about his courage and about what a glorious saviour he is. Okay, let's take a few minutes just to get something of the wonder of it all. So there'll be a few comparisons put up of verses that, uh, that help me to show you what, what's going on. First of all, I want to talk about how the psalm, these first verses, is clearly giving us an insight into what I would call Jesus' spiritual sufferings. And really, they come out in the first verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Which, of course, are almost exactly the same as the words he spoke on the cross, which are recorded in Matthew 27. By the way, if you want to do a detailed study of the comparison, look at Matthew 27 and John 19 and have Psalm 22 open as well and just be amazed at the closeness and accuracy. Anyway, in, in verse 46 of Matthew 27, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, meaning, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was the greatest agony for Jesus, that when he was on the cross, he was bearing my sin and your sin. And he was therefore under the wrath of God, the judgment of God. His, his relationship with his father was clouded in, and obscured in a way he had never experienced in eternity. And he was now suffering for your sin and my sin and suffering our alienation from God, from a holy God. And the Holy God's judgment was falling on him. And that was agony of soul for him. It's beyond our comprehension, but it's touched on there. Then if we look at the next bit I want to illustrate, we'll see something of his psychological sufferings. In Psalm 22, verses 6 to 8, it says, But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, for he delights in him. Now, that is exactly close to what was said by the people round the cross. Round the cross, all sorts of people were mocking Jesus. All sorts of people. Listen, listen to verses 39 and 44 of Matthew 27. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said. He can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants, if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Every strata of society was mocking him. From the thieves beside Jesus dying themselves for their own crimes, the soldiers at the foot of the cross, right through and up to the leaders of the society, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the chief priests, etc. They were all mocking him. And that was reflected and known about and shown. That suffering came through in Psalm 22. And then moving on to what I would call relational suffering. Jesus was deserted, abandoned by his friends. And they showed extraordinary callousness in a way, although they were scared stiff, poor guys, and abandoned him completely, disloyal completely. All the disciples 
Matthew 26, 56 tells us, all the disciples deserted him and fled. Psalm 22 verse 11 says, do not be far from me for trouble is near. That's part of his prayer to God. And there is no one to help. No one is near me, no one to help. And then if we read Psalm 22 verses 12 to 13 again, I think this is an interesting insight. From the cross, now realise this is a prophetic insight of Jesus' experience. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey. They open their mouths wide against me. Now, what's that about? Well, it could be another poetic way of describing what the Pharisees and the chief priests and the people are doing. But I do wonder if that is some insight into some suffering in the realm of the spirit, not so much Jesus' spiritual suffering, which we talked about, his own agony of spirit, but like demonic presences that gathered around him, like roaring lions, like angry bulls, almost eager to devour him. The Satan and his demons thought they got him. Now they've got him. They could take him to hell with them. He, he, he would become part of them because he was made sin now. He was, he was theirs. And they were sort of, as it were, circling, waiting to tear him off the cross, as it were, and take him to hell with them. I wonder if that is reflected in those verses. Of course, they were to lose out in the end. The resurrection broke through out from the bounds of death and of hell. But that wasn't how it was at the point of crucifixion. It seemed that hell had won. I wonder if that reflects that. And then also, let's look at Psalm 22, verses 14 to 18. We have the sort of insights, the physical sufferings of Jesus. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt. What vivid insight into the thirst. Jesus was hanging naked on a cross, having been beaten and bleeding in the blazing midday sun. No water provided whatsoever. A mocking provision of some drugged wine, which he refused. But, but actually, this is an insight into the sheer thirst and the agony of it and the physical pain. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. This is David writing. I'm not quite sure what he must have been thinking of when he wrote it. But what an accurate description of crucifixion. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. Now, actually, I don't want to go too detailed here because it's almost sacred ground, but being crucified was a horrible contortion of the body. People's arms and legs were twisted and nailed. They were naked. They were naked. So people stare and glow over me has a real edge to it. And their bones would have looked out of joint. It was an agonizing way to kill someone. And uh, here it's vividly portrayed. And then finally, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. How accurate is that? Matthew 27, verse 35. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The soldiers callously bet for his clothes as he died in agony a few feet above them. And that's picked up, obviously, in Matthew, as we just read, but in several of the other Gospels as well. Isn't that extraordinary? Isn't the accuracy, or accuracy of that extraordinary? Considering it was genuinely written 1,000 years before Jesus was crucified. What amazing prophetic accuracy. Can you have any doubts about the uniqueness of the Bible, about its consistency from Old and New Testament, about the fact that Jesus was the fulfillment of so much of the prophetic thread that runs through the Old Testament? Well, at verse 22, it all changes and we change to the resurrection. And before we even start on that, let's just learn from what we've been seeing. If the first half of Psalm 22 is so accurate in its portrayal of the details of Jesus' crucifixion a thousand years after it was written, if that's true, and it is true, how exciting it is to realize that the second half 
carries equal authenticity and accuracy about Jesus' resurrection, his vindication, and the worldwide spread of his kingdom through the gospel. And the second half has some equally mysterious elements. It's exciting, it's more uplifting, it's vindication of victory, and it has a resonance for what David was to experience. God answers his prayers, but in it, there are things that don't quite make sense for David about the whole world. We're gonna see a couple of them in the next few minutes. Like the first half, you either pierce the hands of the feet, you think, well, I wonder what Dave was thinking. Something poetic came to him and the Holy Spirit was inspiring him. And the same is true of this second half. That is so exciting. Now, I'd love to spend a lot of time on it. We're not going to. I'm just going to pick up three phrases from the second half of Psalm 22 and apply them to Jesus' re resurrection and the victory of the gospel. And the first phrase I want to pick up is in verse uh, 31, and it's, he has done it. Verse 31 of Psalm 22, they will proclaim his righteousness, how the psalm ends, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Just let that verse sink in. Now that you're thinking about Jesus, now that you're thinking about the resurrection, now that you're thinking about the living, reigning Jesus at the right hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit coming to the church, which I hope is what you're thinking about, they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. We are in that verse. We are a people yet unborn who have heard the good news that Jesus has done it. He has won. He is alive. He is victorious. On the cross, Jesus cried, Tetelestai. It is finished, is how it's translated, and that's accurate. It was a word that would have been written across a debt, paid, or paid in full. But it could have been translated, done. <laughs> done, paid, done, finished. Phil Moore, in his little commentary on this, says that you could roughly translate Tetelestai, he has done it. <laughs> It, it is of the same order of, of, of language. It's a victory cry. It's, it's something completed and done. What has he done? What has Jesus done? Well, in Christ, God has found a way to reconcile the world to himself, to reconcile you and me to himself. Even though we're sinners and under the judgment of God, and we should be cast out from his presence forever, we can come boldly and freely into his presence through a new and living way, Jesus Christ. That way has been opened up through his body, through, through his flesh torn on the cross. The, resur the crucifixion has opened the way for us to come to, to a holy God freely and boldly because Jesus has borne our sins in his body on the cross. And in Jesus and his death, we have hope and life and eternal life. There's a verse I always love to quote, you might have heard me quote it before, which sort of sums up the gospel. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God, say it may, it's God who did it, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. It's awesome. It's so awesome you can miss it. It's a simple explanation of the Christian gospel, which is unique and wonderful. And listen to it again. God did it. We couldn't do anything for ourselves. God did it. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. He bore my sin in his body on the cross. He bore your sin when he died. And he came under the judgment of God for it. It was like burnt up when he was dying. It was like destroyed. And, and, and paid off, if you think of it as a debt, he was paying it off for you and me, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. So we might receive as a gift the righteousness of God. What an exchange. My sin, like dirty clothes, put on Jesus, burn up on him as he died on the cross, his righteousness imputed and imparted to me so that I'm clothed in the beautiful white garments of Christ's righteousness. I don't deserve it, it's grace, 
but it's happened. I am a new creation. There is no condemnation when I'm in Jesus Christ. When I put my faith in him, I'm free and I'm clean and I'm new. He has done it. Let's pick up another phrase. I will tell your name to my brothers. Now, that's what it should be, brothers. The verse I think I quoted from the NIV, and I unfortunately translate it people. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. But actually, it is brothers. It's a family name. It's a filial name. And it's quoted uh, in Hebrews 2.12 as one of the statements that Jesus makes when he's risen from the dead. He's now got brothers. He's got family. It's a big subject, so I can't really get into it, but it's a wonderful subject. When you put your faith in Jesus, his death and resurrection result in you being born again from above by the Holy Spirit, and you become a child of God. You become a brother, sister of Jesus. You become into the same family, and the same DNA begins to come in you, the Holy Spirit, and it begins to give you something of the family characteristics. But you also become a co-heir with Jesus. You begin to share his inheritance, which you will go on sharing for eternity. You're a joint heir with Jesus. That's incredible. You are his family, his brothers and sisters. When Jesus rose from the dead, the first person he spoke to was a woman, Mary Magdalene. And, and he, he says, <laughs> it's wonderful, you know, I'm going to my father and your father. That's it. Something's happened now where my father can be your father, he says to her. And she had a very, very broken life and been demonized, had seven demons cast out of her. But now through the work of the cross and the risen Jesus can say, you are now a child of God, acceptable to my father as I'm acceptable to my father. Isn't that wonderful? And that could be true for you as well. I hope and pray it is. Jesus died for us, not just for our sakes, there is something here of his excitement, the joy he got out of it. He got brothers and sisters. He brought many sons to glory. That was the joy he set before him as he endured the cross. He knew he wasn't just letting us off a debt, though that is magnificent and costly. He was bringing us into a whole new relationship with God as our father. And we would be his family forever and ever. It is wonderful stuff. And then finally, because I've only got time to draw out a little bit, here's this phrase, all the ends of the earth. And that will be found in verse 27. Let me read it to you. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Wow. Now, this is where, again, where we feel we're lifted right out of anything David could be thinking about himself, really. And there's something prophetic that came through the Holy Spirit that applies to Jesus and applies to his victory and applies to his resurrection and applies to the gospel and applies to his kingdom. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. It's probably worth reading, if you're interested, all the verses around there, verses 27 to 31. And if you're a Christian, I do suggest you to read it. Uh, and then if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, become one today and then read it. <laughs> read Psalm 22, whatever your situation is, and I hope God will speak to you out of it. But the reason I'm highlighting those verses, verse 27 to 31, is that they give us an insight into the prophetic elements in the psalm which apply to the gospel age and beyond, probably, in the new heavens and new earth. But they do apply to the gospel age. They apply to a foreseen spreading of this victorious king's kingdom. A, a universal application to men and women, all the ends of the earth, all the families of the nations. And as you read those verses, you'll see rich and poor briefly referred to. All generations, the young and the old. The gospel of Jesus Christ, his victory, is for everyone on the planet, all the ends of the earth, all the families of the nations, rich, poor, young, old, all can benefit. The New Testament tells us who es whosoever, whosoever will may come to God through Jesus Christ. Whosoever will. Do you want to come? You can come. Through Jesus Christ, you can come back to God. You can come and name as your father. You can be blessed and become part of his great family we've just been talking about. We are all lost. We have all sinned. 
we have all missed it with God. We aren't children of God in this sense, naturally at all. We're created by him, but we're a long way from him. We've turned our backs on him. We've gone our own way. We've gone astray. And Jesus Christ has provided a way for all of us, any of us, to come back to the Father. And it has this phrase, which I want to highlight as we come towards the end. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. I believe this is a promise for the gospel age. There is a potential for all the ends of the earth, all the families of the nations, any individual anywhere, to remember and turn to the Lord. Now, isn't that an interesting phrase? We all need to know and remember that we don't, we're not just animals, we're not just the products of blind chance, evolved out of the slime and that's that, going back to dust just like a, another poor creature. We are made in the image of God. We're children of God. Our hope, our destiny, our purpose is found in our relationship with the living God, our creator, our father. And we need to be reconciled to him. And it's a characteristic of our natural fallen state that we forget God. We've forgotten God. We've forgotten. We've turned our back on him. We live as if there were no God. We need to remember and turn to the Lord. Remember who we are. Remember what we're made to be. Remember where we're made to be. Adam and Eve were to be in harmony. We're in harmony with God. Walked in the garden with him. We're a close relationship with him. We're in a place of peace and serenity. We can be in that place with God. We can be restored to that through Jesus Christ. But we need to remember we need it. We need to wake up, basically. Remember, you know, we're all in the middle of an extraordinary crisis, this coronavirus COVID-19 crisis, which is affecting the whole world. Just read the news as I came in today, and the World Health Organization says it's probably getting worse. Globally, it hasn't even peaked. There's nations that are just beginning to get into the, 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 the effects of this virus. And it's pretty grim, and it's really wrecked economies around the world, including our own. I wonder if one of the benefits that will come out of this is to wake us up and remember we belong to God, remember the Lord and turn to him. And if it has that benefit, it will have been worth it for all the agony. We need to wake up. We need to remember and turn to the Lord. Salvation doesn't happen to you unless you do something. It's not automatic. You have to remember and turn to the Lord. And the two things are together. Remembering on its own, I would argue, is not enough. It's a bit like intellectually acknowledging that there is a God. Waking up and thinking, oh, maybe there is more to life than I think. Maybe there is a God. Now, that's a good start, but it doesn't save you until you add the next bit. Remember and turn to the Lord. Turn means turn, <laughs> but it's a similar word to the word repent in the Bible. It's turning away from your present life, turning away from the things that you've been absorbed with and, and turning your eyes to God. It's literally turn, turn from one thing to another. And, and that's what we need to do. We need to remember and turn to the Lord. Lord, I need you. Forgive me. Save me. Help me. Lord, restore me. I want to be yours. Whatever way you put it, whatever word you use, because they need to be your words, please remember who you are. You're a child of God, created by him. He, You are unique and known of God. He knows you. But you don't know him until you turn to him and ask for his forgiveness and trust in all that Jesus did in the agonies of the cross that we saw earlier and in the victories of his resurrection that we're sort of looking at now and believe that through Jesus you can come to know God because you can. It's true. Remember and turn to the Lord. No sincere seeker who turns to the Lord will ever be turned away. I assure you, nobody who sincerely turns to the Lord will find the door shut in his face. The door is wide open. Come, all whosoever will may come. Come to Jesus. The gospel is a call for everyone. There is no difference between race, gender, class, intelligence, wealth, education. No difference that can keep you away. 
from salvation, keep you away from the living God. He made us all. We're all made by him. We're all equal in that sense, truly equal. And this offer extends to all too. It's available to all the ends of the earth, to all the families of the nations. The only question, the only question is how will individuals respond? How will you respond? Will you remember and turn to the Lord? I pray you do today, right now. Remember and turn to the Lord and you will find peace and joy and cleansing and refreshing and a relationship with the living God that you never dreamt possible. God bless you.